What made you decide to write a memoir? Why? Has anyone else ever had to fight for the love of their parents? <laughs> Hey all, you're listening to Chicago Humanities Tapes, the audio arm of Chicago's live festival, creating experiences through culture, creativity, and connection. I'm Elisa Rosenthal, and I've been looking to our programs for the answers to humanity's biggest questions by picking the coolest conversations from our current season and diving back into our incredible archives dating back to 1991. Our spring festival's currently underway. Head over to chicagohumanities.org to sign up for our email list and to learn more about our, dare I say, baller lineup. Speakers like Steve Stacey Abrams, Andy Cohen, Kid Koala, Gigi Gorgeous with Got Mick, Joan Baez, all right around the corner. Today, oh, today is a treat, dear listeners. We're landing square in the front row of Simu Liu's sold-out conversation at Chicago's historic movie theater, The Music Box, as he's interviewed by Joanne Molinero, aka The Korean Vegan. Liu, the star of Marvel's first-ever Asian superhero movie, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings, and who you might also recognize from the very bingeable Kim's Convenience, brings warmth and a lot of energy to his conversation with Molinero, who went viral on TikTok for her recipe videos and stories of her Korean image immigrant experience. Buckle up for an audience that cannot keep their collective minds together, and I'll see you on the other side. Hello? Hi, everyone. Oh my god, there's so many of you. We're all here to see you. <laughs> They're here to see us, Joanne. They're here to see um, us. Nobody here wanted to go to the Cubs game instead? No. No. Really? No. I mean, I guess. I mean, sure. I, I would have chosen the sports game, I mean, myself. Well, it's so great to see you guys. I hope you're ready to have a good time. Are you guys ready to have a good time? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Let's do it. Let's do it. You look thoroughly ready for a cross-examination, well, by the you know way, what? Joanne. I don't, know, I don't know how many of you guys know this, but Joanne uh, is, is, a, is a lawyer. I am. I am. I'm a lawyer. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, welcome to Chicago. Thank you so much. It's Let's so good to be here. how much we love him. God, it's so great to see everyone. I didn't know there were this many Asian people in Chicago. I know there's... <laughs> and and, and we, welcome, we welcome everybody, just so we're clear. But it, it, it definitely surprised me. We're here for you. We're here for you, Heck Simu. Yeah. yeah. When you're talking about Simu, he's the kind of guy where you look at him and you're like, it's so unfair that God gave one person all this talent. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we see now we've got a list of accolades and you probably have done enough to write like 15 memoirs, but you're only 33. <laughs> what made you decide to write a memoir? Why? Has anyone else ever had to fight for the love of their parents? <laughs> it's partially that, right? It's like, it's like I, the moment I, I realized that I made the New York Times, maybe you have a similar experience, Joanne, but it's like as soon as you made the list, you were just, I was just like, oh, maybe now my parents will love me. <laughs> Come not on. when you, you know, became a Marvel superhero, but when you no, made the list. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's, it's, the, ah, it's the prestige. It's the, no, I mean, I knew I had a story that I wanted to tell, right? And it wasn't necessarily a story about me so much as it was a story about my family, about, you know, intergenerational conflict, but then ultimately reconciliation. And then a story about immigrants who... who come to this new country with nothing in their pockets except just hopes and dreams of, of building a better life. Um, I wanted to tell that story. And, and I wanted to tell it at a, at a point in my life where, you know, people like you and I could read it, people who are younger than us can read it, and not be like, oh, this guy's totally out of touch. You know, because I could easily have written a memoir at like age 55 or 60, mm. and it would have been like, hello, fellow kids, like back <laughs> when I was your age. Before the metaverse existed and <laughs> everyone just had implants and, you know, whatever. Um, Is that where we're headed, Seymour? That's right. <laughs> yes, yes, that's where we're headed. Before the age of NFTs, before Bitcoin ruled the world, there was a time where, yeah. So, I mean, I, I think it's, there's just something really, really valuable about, about having kind of a relatable tone. I mean, for those of you guys uh, who have read the book, um, you'll know there's, it's chock full of like nerdy references to Star Wars and Harry Potter and yes. things that, you know, like boy bands in the 90s, like things that I grew up with. We have two Gryffindors on stage, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> two Gryffindors. 
<laughs> oh, yeah? From Pottermore.com? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah, yeah. It sure, is the undeniable. Sure. I was worried that I would be a Slytherin, by the way. I actually kind of wanted to be a little bit. Right. Well, yeah, they get a bad rap in the movies, but I feel like Slytherin, like the, the defining characteristic of Slytherins are like they're very ambitious and they're cunning, which are all good, you know, good things. But anyway, Gryffindor. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, yeah, I, th I thought it was very important for me to, to come out with this book at this point in my life. This is the story that I wanted to tell. And I think it's, it was very much a full circle moment when, you know, I found out that I was cast in Shang-Chi because, you know, my parents... I was, I was 32 years, uh, oh God, I gotta do math. I was 30 years old, failed accountant, guys. I was, I was 30 years old when I was cast as Shang-Chi and, um, and my parents were 30 when they first you know, came uh, across the ocean to, to Canada for the first time. And so there's just like such a beautiful parallel about our lives and the points at our lives that we were at when we decided to put it all on the line and we're finally rewarded with it. And so, yeah, the, the, it's, the book is very much about just you know, two generations of dreamers who, who, you know, looked off into the horizon, set a goal, and then, you know, gave themselves permission to, to pursue it. You mentioned two generations of dreamers, but there are actually three generations represented in your book. And I think my two favorite people in your book are Yeye and Nai Nai. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but your grandparents. Yeah, yeah, Nai -Nai. Yeah, yeah. And you talk about how they created this beautiful cocoon of love for you between the age of when you were born and five. Can you remember specifically like what they did for you to make you feel so loved and saved? Shortly after I was born, I was born in Harbin, China, and shortly after I was born, my parents uh, left me to go uh, to, to Canada to, to pursue their postgraduate studies. And um, it just didn't quite seem feasible at the time to have a kid and have a full course load and to, you know, build a life. Like, it just, you know, it, it didn't make sense. And meanwhile, my grandparents were just there. They're retired. They're ready. So um, my grandparents raised me until I was four and a half. And then one day my dad showed up and was like, hi, I'm your dad. <laughs> and I'm here to take you to your new life in Canada. And it was, um, you know, I'm sure for him it was like a very happy ending moment because it was like, you know, our family's finally going to be together. But in my mind, I was like, I already have a family. And that family was my, my yeah, yeah, and my nai nai. And, um, and like you mentioned, Joanne, um, you know, all of my memories of, you know, my early childhood up until I was four and a half. There, I mean, there weren't many, obviously, but, but from what I do remember, little bits and pieces, um, they were just so loving and so patient with me. I mean, I remember, you know, I just remember... You know, my, my grandma, my nai nai, uh, was obsessed with covering me in blankets. Mm. And no matter what I would, like, no matter how many blankets I had, it was never enough. And she always just would find a way to, like, in the middle of the night, wrap me in another layer. And I was just, like, literally cocooned <laughs> in, like, just mountains of blankets. And um, that was just the kind of care that she approached you know, um, you know, ra raising a child with, and she was a pediatrician as well. So, you know, that, that was kind of her, mm. her entire life was, was taking care of children. Um, my, my yeah, yeah, was uh, a chemistry professor and was just like a very academic person who would sit me down, even though I was three years old and would try to like lecture at me, not in a, not in a, not in a bad way, but just as, you know, I remember him trying to describe to me like the, the, importance of keeping your word. And there was something that at three I had no concept of, right? But I just remember, you know, he, he would sit me down and he would say, now, Simu, if you make a promise, that means that you prom that means you have to do something. That means you give me your word. And if you break your word, that means that, you know, I can't, I, I can't trust you next time. And I was like, well, I don't want that. And so the context is um, whenever we would like go to the street markets near our house, I would always find something that I wanted whether it was like a popsicle or like a, you know, like a children's book or something. And when I didn't get it, I had this um, tendency to throw like really bad tantrums. <laughs> no, I like don't I would it. like I would like lie on the floor and like, <laughs> like it's not cute. But uh, my my grandpa was like, so next time I take you like you have to prom otherwise I'm not going to take you. you. You have to promise not to not to throw a tantrum. And that was when, that was how he taught me the importance of, of keeping your word. So. Um, you know, he, and he was never, like, he never raised his voice, was always patient, and just every night we, um, 
and I'm maybe a little embarrassed to admit this, but we, we all slept in the same bed every night. Um, and, uh, and I just, I never wanted to be anywhere else. I never wanted to be mm. around anyone else. And uh, when my dad came, it was like a big shock to all of us, to me. And, um, you know, he, he was like, well, first we have to get him to stop sleeping with his grandparents. And I, I just like adamantly refused because they were my, they were everything to me. You know, they were, they were, they were your safety. cocoon. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, well, you don't have to be embarrassed. I slept with my grandmother until I was probably eight years old. So I imagine there are probably quite a few of us who did that. Yeah. I love that memory of your grandfather explaining to you the social contract that you call it. <laughs> and you actually talk about it throughout the book. You kind of go back to that memory about how it sort of reframed the way that you interacted with people, maybe it got you off the floor from you know, those temper <laughs> tantrums, but it was clearly something that kind of stuck inside of you. Mm -hmm. What do you think that that memory means about the kind of man that you wanted to be from that lesson? Oh man, <laughs> that's heavy. I mean, I think I always wanted to be the kind of man that my, my grandpa was. I think I, lo I looked up to him and I admired him in every possible way. He seemed, you know, all-knowing and endlessly patient and accommodating of others to, like, a fault. I mean, he, he, said, he, he would say one thing to me over and over again, and he would say, you know, it, it, doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter the way that people treat me. I'll always give them a smile. I'll always treat them with a smile no matter what. And it, it was frustrating at times, too, because I was like, you shouldn't. My, my grandpa once got scammed, like, pretty badly on yeah. the street. So I was like, yeah, maybe not, like, everybody. <laughs> um, but, but certainly, I think he, he set just such a high standard of, of the person, you know, the, the person that I wanted, to, I wanted to grow up to be. And then, you know, you know, kind of by contrast to that, it was like, when I arrived in Canada and then all of a sudden had to spend time with this entirely new family, basically with my mom and dad, um, I kind of found that their parenting style was very different. They were very temperamental. Um, they wouldn't hesitate to lash out, to say hurtful words. Um, you know, sometimes things would get physical, but I'm sure we'll get into that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's so interesting because when you read the book, it's almost like you sort of realize after the fact, well, this little boy, he was told, these are your parents, welcome to your parents, uh, you're supposed to love your parents, but in actuality, they were kind of strangers, right? You really only knew of them through maybe pictures and what you learned. On the other side of things, in retrospect, how do you think your parents felt about you? There's like this little boy who's supposed to be their son, they're supposed to love their son, but also their son's sort of a stranger. Yeah, well, I mean, for most parents, you know, just, just, by, just by raising a child, you kind of learn by doing, like it's kind of a trial and error. I mean, I don't know, I don't have kids. <laughs> But um, it's a trial and error of like navigating every single day, watching your child grow and learn new things. And, and you know, there's kind of an exciting process uh, that comes with that. And, and I feel like for my parents, you know, they, they, for better or for worse, skipped like, you know, three, almost four years of my development. And then, you know, also they were kind of, I think, growing quite accustomed to this lifestyle of just like the mm -hmm. two of them. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom. You know, no, like, training, no class, no application process. It was just, like, you now have a son, and he's four and a half. And here you go. <laughs> um, and so I think, you know, again, what on paper probably felt like a happy ending because it was finally the family unit coming together again in this, in this new place, you know, Canada. We're home, finally. So what probably started as a happy ending quickly became, you know, the reality of it setting in is, like, Oh, geez, I'm responsible for this kid. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. Like, there was this, you know, one of the first, like, weeks that I was, I was in Canada, and I write about this in the book, but um, I was taking a nap, and my mom needed to do groceries, and she was like, please don't, please don't throw my mom in jail. Uh, she, but she was like, <laughs> she was like, oh, I kind of need to just... <laughs> I need to step out and do groceries, and, and she was sleeping, so I think I'm just going to... And so she just kind of went and... She figured that I would be asleep and she could just like sneak off. And obviously that's not how children work. And I kind of woke up like, I would say pr pretty much almost immediately, I, I was 
I remember being panicked. I was looking around the house. My parents are nowhere to be found. So it was cold. It was like in the middle of winter. So I did the only thing that I thought I, you know, that I could think of, which is to put on all of my snow pants and snow gear and my mitts. And like, I was, I was literally going to go out looking for them. And, um, you know, obviously it was, I was very scared, but I was sitting at the top of the steps um, looking at the door and I was crying. And it was at that point that my mom came through the door and she was like, oh my God, I effed up. <laughs> so, so, you know, a very much a rude awakening for, for her, but also, you know, kind of understandable given that she just had no idea what she was, what she was doing. So that, I, I think that's the first piece. And then the second piece is that, you know, when you are, when you are around your child every single day and you're watching the ways that they develop, I feel like, you know, you're able to kind of you maybe take more accountability for the person that they've become. You've watched them grow every step of the way, so you can kind of see where, where all of their kind of little mannerisms and idiosyncrasies come from. And it's a little bit different when someone just kind of plops in front of you, and then it's like, you know, I, I just like feel my parents oftentimes being like, why is he like this? Like, why is he so, you know, why is he so shy? I was very shy when I was little. Why is he so shy? Why won't he talk? Or why, why does he, you know, um, I, I, was, I was like, kind of clumsy with my hands. I mean, I still am, but I, I was, um, and they were, you know, just like, why are they, why is he so clumsy? And it was, it, I just kind of constantly felt myself being judged, um, which is, you know, obviously not a, not a healthy environment to, to grow up in. Now you talk about being judged and you also mm. are keen about your parents feeling enormous pressure at the arrival of a brand new baby <laughs> on their doorstep. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, you write in your book, I was the perfect baby. I was the torchbearer of my family name and per government policy at the time, the only child. My tiny shoulders would bear the weight of their combined hopes, dreams, and ambitions. And I know there are probably so many of you who are sitting here today who can attest to the same feeling of pressure from immigrant parents. And I know your parents went through quite a lot, you know, not just when you first arrived, but throughout your childhood. When can you pinpoint a time like in your past when you're like, oh, wow, I feel all the pressure on my shoulders all of a sudden? Yeah, it kind of, I mean, I think it started right away with, with school. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, my, my parents were academics. Um, um, they were, you know, they were a part of a, a, a very kind of legendary class in, in China during the Cultural Revolution, basically. For 10 years, universities were shuttered. Um, in China, and this was per government policy, it was like, so, so basically when people graduated from high school in China between 1966 and 1976, um, the vast majority of them just went off to work in the fields, and um, it, it was a policy called Shang Shan Xia Xiang, or up the, up the mountains and down the countryside, and, um, and so it was kind of like, it, it was a loss of hope for an entire generation of Chinese youth who otherwise would have had the opportunities to go to college and, and receive training in different fields. And um, in 1976, the uh, college admission was finally reinstated. It was when uh, Chairman Mao passed away and his, his successor was like, no, this is kind of messed up. We need people to go to college and get education. Um, and then my parents were a part of that first class back, but you can imagine the backlog of 10 years worth of applicants. So they were basically competing against 10 years worth of, of, of people who you know, missed out on the chance to go to college. And of course, their only spots, the, the number of spots never changed. So um, it, it basically what I'm trying to say is that the, the success that they achieved was very much due to their academic achievement. Right, and, and their academic success was the key to their socioeconomic mobility. It was because they were able to go to university that they were able to subsequently get jobs as engineers. And then, you know, after working for a number of years, that's when they got the opportunity to leave the country to pursue further education. And so it, it makes total sense that they would kind of pass those values mm -hmm. on to their next of kin or me, basically just me, shouldering, yeah, shouldering all of that. and the expectations. And then, you know, compounded, of course, with this idea of like this immigrant anxiety, which I've just kind of really started to kind of tap into these last few years, just thinking about how my parents must have felt 
coming over, not having any sort of support system, not having anybody to call if they couldn't make, you know, uh, an electricity payment or, you know, if they lost their job. Like, there really was nothing. And, and to top it all off, too, like, you know, they left their jobs in China as well, so they very much burned that bridge. They cut off their support system abroad. So there was really just, n you know, nothing. And so you can imagine why our parents and why people of that generation are so hardworking, you know, th th there would be because there was no alternative. The alternative was, was just to be destitute or to be out on the streets. And, and so, and, you know, for us in, in, in our generation, we, we kind of bore the weight of all of that expectation, right? Because the expectation was that they're working and they're sacrificing so that their kids can have every possible opportunity to succeed in all the ways that they did and more. And um, yeah, I felt it pretty much from the get-go. It was like, I remember the first time I was graded, it was like first grade. And, um, you know, and my parents, and, and they were very, very clear. They were like, you know, when we were when we were your age, we were the top of the class. So you have to be the top of your class. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I was for a bit, which, which I think, you know, satiated them and made them proud. But then, you know, a crazy thing happened. I went through puberty. <laughs> and I, start, I started to like want other things in life. I like, you know, it's like, it's like um, you know, when you go through puberty and you, and you before, before that point, everyone's just kind of friends with everyone in class. Like, you remember your second grade? It's like, there's no cool kids when you're seven years old. Everyone's just kind of, everyone's just kind of cool or not cool or whatever. But then, but then you know, your, um, but then your nads drop or the equivalent <laughs> or the equivalent for the, and, and then it's like, all of a sudden these hierarchies start to develop, right? Like, I remember, maybe like fourth or fifth grade, you're like, oh, there's cool kids. And I'm not cool kids. <laughs> I am nowhere near cool kids. And then so for me, I was like, but I, like, I, wanted, I wanted that. You know, I wanted to be uh, cool and I wanted to play sports and I wanted to do those things. And, um, you know, as, as so many people want to do, I feel like it's the most normal thing in the world. But to, to my parents, to many of our parents, it was blasphemy, right? Um, and that's where kind of the, <laughs> that's really where the root of all of our struggles and our, and our disagreements kind of came from. I think that one of the funny things about kind of your journey is that there's this constant push and pull between rebelling from your parents and saying, no, nah, I'm not going to do what you want me to do. But then always sort of undergirding that is this kind of desire to please them and to make them proud of you. I thought it was funny. How many of you have had your parents tell you you're going to be a lawyer, a doctor, a pharmacist, or accountant? Yeah, I've had that conversation too. One of the really interesting things that you write is that your parents didn't want you to become a doctor or a lawyer, but they wanted you to be someone who changed and shaped the world. So they had these like impossible dreams for you, <laughs> right? So I got to ask you, I really have to ask you, this is dead serious. Is that why you were so determined to work for Abercrombie so that you could change the world? I have to believe that's why. <laughs> Joanne, that was not the question that I expected to come out of that. That's what lawyers do. They surprise wow. you. Wow. <laughs> the art of misdirection, folks. Um, <laughs> how did we... <laughs> but I just love the angst that was written about your attempt at yes. working for Abercrombie. You guys remember Abercrombie and Fitch, right? I mean, it start. I, I feel like... Well, first of all, I feel very old because it's like Abercrombie and Fitch is like come into fashion, gone out of fashion, and now I feel like it's come back into fashion, right? I'm, I'm seeing some nods from Gen Z. They're like, yeah, Abercrombie's cool now. Okay, cool, yeah. I mean, yeah, back in my day, it was like very much the, um, it was very much like the shirtless dudes outside the store. It was like, hey, what's up? Did you try on our jeans? Um, and yeah, I remember, I remember that was like the coolest thing in the world to me. Like, I was like, I, that, I want that job. I need that job. I'm not sure why. I think part of it was this, uh, you know, part of it was, you know, gr growing up Asian, I mean, so many of us know, like, to, to grow up Asian American or Asian Canadian oftentimes is to be invisible. And, you know, what is more visible <laughs> than being shirtless and lubed up in a, in a mall? <laughs> 
and coercing people to go inside Abercrombie & Fitch. So I, I, I guess a part of me just really craved that, um, that attention and that admiration, I guess. And so, and, and here's the thing too, it's like you would, you know, very, very often, or, or I would say, it was very unlikely that you applied for a job at Abercrombie. Much more like most people got scouted by Abercrombie. Do you guys know? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing nods in the audience. <laughs> Maybe some of you have been scouted. Has anyone been scouted by an Abercrombie? Oh my God, yeah. Oh yeah, you look, definitely, ma'am. <laughs> ma'am, you, you look like you would be, yes. Abercrombie material for sure. Um, so I would like, I would like, you know, as a teenager, I would like go into the stores and just be like. <laughs> Hanging out? <laughs> oh, me? No, I don't. I'm just looking. <laughs> and, uh, and I never got scouted one single time. And ev <laughs> eventually I got so desperate that I did decide to take matters into my own hands. And I, um, and I walked in with a resume and I applied for a job the old-fashioned way. Did a group interview. Um, and then I got the job. And then I became a model at Abercrombie & Fitch. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you. But in, in all seriousness, I mean, you, you talk a lot about in the book about Asian representation or uh -huh. the lack thereof or uh -huh. the misrepresentation sure. of, of particularly the Asian man in uh -huh. Hollywood and elsewhere. And I think that, you know, you in your funny way, you know, approaching that job at Abercrombie was maybe your first time of really trying to disrupt that stereotype. Uh -huh. But what was it like when you landed the role um, for Shang-Chi? I mean, kind of take yourself back to when you were a little boy, you talk about how your parents were constantly dropping you off at the theater and leaving mm -hmm. you there for hours. What do you think it would have meant to little Simu to see a movie like Shang-Chi, seeing someone like you on the big screen? I mean, I think it, I think it would have been pretty cool. Because <laughs> um, I can count on my hand the number of times I saw myself on a screen when I was a kid, right? Yellow Power Ranger? Shout out to Trini. May she rest in peace. Um, um, short round. Very happy that he's making a comeback. Um, and then, you know, like, like kind of, you know, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, but, but the thing about Jackie Chan was like, he always played these characters, these kind of fish out of water, man from the east kind of characters. And, and you know, that, that wasn't necessarily us, right? Like we were, we're from here, like we speak, we speak English. And so as much as I think we celebrated in Jackie's success and in Jet's success and in Bruce Lee's success, it was always, there was always a little bit of a distance. So I think it would have been, it, it would have meant the world to me to have seen somebody, not, not, not even necessarily a superhero, but to just be able to turn on the TV and to see someone like me reflected on screen. I think that would have, I think that would have made me feel like I was more a part of the world that I was in. You know, there was, I don't know if you guys felt this way, but growing up, you just never felt like TV or media or culture was like a, was like a participatory event for us. Like we were always kind of just on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And um, to see Shang-Chi is like, to know that no, we're not on the sidelines. We are in there. We're a piece. We're a piece of this puzzle. We're an integral piece, and we and we kind of deserve to. We deserve to be there, you know. Um, and I can remember very clearly. I remember very clearly the first time I saw my story reflected on stage was when I watched the stage play uh, version of Kim's Convenience. It was the uh, winter before I was cast in the show. For those of you who don't know, Kim's Convenience was, at first, it was a, it was a Toronto Fringe Festival play. And it was incredible, you know, it, it, it spoke about intergenerational turmoil and, and, you know, shouldering parental expectations. And I remember sitting there in the audience after curtain call and I was bawling my eyes out and I was just like having this, this epiphany moment where I was like, I didn't know art could do that. You know, like, I, to me, up until that point, every play that I saw was like Shakespeare. It was like, Okay, I can appreciate what this is, you know, but there's a distance. There's like, it's people talking in funny costumes. And uh, Kim's Convenience was like, it, it, it opened my heart and it just like poured the contents all out there. And I was watching, I was watching these characters, but I was watching myself. I was watching the conversations that I wish I could have with my parents. And it just felt like that place saw me so clearly and and you know it's like i never felt seen before and i, I held on to that feeling because i was like 
there, there's so many of us who have never felt that way before. And, and you know, what I hope that our show did, what I hope that our movie did was that was, it, it helped, you know, at least in, hopefully in some small way, you know, um, instill that feeling in, in you all, you know, watching and, and feeling like, oh, wow, this, this movie sees me or this show sees me. And I think there's something very, very powerful about, about that. I think one of the things that Kim's Convenience did very well, which you just touched upon, is this interation or intergenerational struggle, right? But in your book, you're very candid about kind of a very tough situation at home, right? You come from this cocoon of love to what you call a shattering of safety. And there were times where things did get physically violent with you. And, you know, it's amazing because I know, having read through the end of the book and having seen pictures of your mom, she's so proud of you. She's so proud of the book. I understand you had to revisit some of these harder times in your past with your parents and maybe talk through some of these issues. How much of the writing process has facilitated kind of a healing for you and your parents? It's been, it's been incredible. Um, you know, not only, not only for, for all of our kind of willingness to explore those tough times, but also just to, for me to be able to sit down and really go year by year and to, to learn my parents' story, you know? I, I feel like so often we hear these little anecdotes that our parents kind of throw at us from time to time, and like, we're not always ready to hear them, like, you know, we're, we're like brushing our teeth, or we're like on our way, you know, we're like trying to do our homework, we're like, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. Um, but I'm, you know, to, to actually sit down and, and go, and to say, you know, I, I, I had a few kind of big, you know, overarching questions, right? I wanted to know what it was that compelled them to leave their kind of place of safety and to venture out. And, you know, where did you first get the idea to come to Canada? Where did that even, you know, like for, for people growing up in, in China in the 60s and 70s, like where, where do you even get that idea? How do you, po and, and then like who told you what to do? How, you know, what motivated you to, you know, what was the driving force behind it? What were your, what were your ambitions? What were your dreams? What were your anxieties, you know? Um, was it everything that you thought it would be? Would you do it again? Like there was just so many, so many question marks for me and just to sit down and to really talk to them and, and you know, for a moment they just took, it, it, it felt like I was talking to an equal, you know, because they were, talking about things that they were, you know, thinking when they were in their 20s, in their early 30s, and it just, you know, it brought us, I think, to just like a, a level, a level field where I could look across and see my, my equal, somebody that I saw myself in, versus, you know, our parents sometimes, you know, they're, they're, they're our parents. Yeah, they are, they are, at the end of the day, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we have, I could talk to you for hours, but I definitely wanted to save room for our uh, pre-submitted audience Q&A right. questions, because these are really good. Okay. So are you ready for them? Yeah. So this one is actually one that I wanted to get to, so I'm really glad. Rashika asks, how did you build the strength, determination, and resolve to follow through in turning your dreams and passions into reality? As someone figuring out what they want to do next in life, aimlessness feels like the greatest challenge. Yeah, um, I feel that so much. <laughs> and, and to be honest, I mean, I wish I could tell you that I had this master plan all along, but I didn't. It happened very, very accidentally. I mean, um, I've been very candid about it on social media, so if you haven't heard yet, um, I, I was an accountant at one point. I worked for a, a big four firm, um, Deloitte. Did someone just say F Deloitte? <laughs> there are children here, sir. I'm looking at one in the front row right now. He's a very sweet boy. And it looks like he's going to be a great accountant one day. So, you know, you... <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, so I, I lasted about eight months. It was, it was some of the most miserable days of my life. And then one day I was, I was laid off, and I did not expect to be laid off, even though I was, looking back, I was like, no, that, that, made, that made sense. <laughs> I, I was very bad at my job. But, but it, took, it took that rock bottom moment for me, and then just kind of like that aimlessness that you described that led me to say, you know what, screw it. 
what's something that I want to do right now? And um, I went on Craigslist. Naturally. <laughs> and, I, and I typed, I, I was just like, TV and film jobs in Toronto. Guys, don't do this today. It's a very different world out there. I would not recommend it for anyone. If you, if you want to get started in your acting career, there's many resources out. Do not go on Craigslist. I didn't know any better. I went on Craigslist and somehow wound up on the set of Pacific Rim as an extra. I was, I was doing little, like, little music videos and, and really all it was was things to pass the time until eventually I would, you know, find my way back into the workplace. But I was just having so much fun and one thing kind of led to another, led to another and then before I knew it I had an agent and then before I knew it I would booked like a, a national commercial. I had a speaking role on a TV show and then, you know, I remember um, the TV show was Nikita, Nikita for the CW. Some people watched it, yeah, yeah. Um, but I had, a, I had a scene with Shane West from a so walk to, jealous. yeah, Shane West. A walk to remember, that's like the proto, that's like Ryan, you know, Ryan Gosling in The Notebook, but before, he was OG. And uh, I remember I was so nervous and I got to set and I'm getting mic'd for the first time and I see Shane and he's so friendly and then I'm, I'm just like, I had this epiphany of like, I'm surrounded by people who made this their entire job. And that's freaking incredible. And so I just, after that, I was like, why can't, why should this just be a hobby for me? If Shane West can do it. Hell yes. Maybe I can do it too. Yes, you can. Um, and, and honestly, that's, that's how it started. But would I have had the courage to leave my job on my, on my own? I don't think so. So that's, you know, that's why it's so important for me to be sitting here and, 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 and you know, giving some sort of advice out because I don't want each and every one of you to have to wait to be fired from your jobs <laughs> to finally give yourself permission to pursue your dreams. It shouldn't be that. And um, you know, aimlessness can be a really good thing. You know, it means that you're in a reflective period in your life where you know, not everything is sure. You know, it's way better to be unsure than to be on a ship that has sailed and you're pretty sure you don't want to go where the ship is taking you. And you're just stuck, you know, you're going nine to five and you're, you know, all engines forward and, you know, I guess ships don't have engines. You know, you get the, you get the analogy. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a way worse position to be in. Trust me, I've, I've been there. Um, but I would say if you're feeling aimless, then, you know, you need to, you need to taste. Like you need to give yourself the time and space to kind of try different things. And you know, being unsure is not an excuse to just be inactive. Like you don't waste time by trying things and realizing that you don't like it, you know? And, um, and I would say you gotta really look inward because I, I truly believe that there's, there's something within all of us that we're not always ready to admit to ourselves is, is our passion or our dream. Sometimes we're afraid of judgment from the world. We're afraid of what our parents will think. We're afraid of what our loved ones will think, um, what our friends will think. And, and so we just like, we eat that dream before it ever gets out, you know? Movie star, what the hell? Like who, you know, <laughs> are you on crack? <laughs> um, but it, it took that rock bottom moment where I was like, well, what, what else do I have to lose? What else do I, you know? And, and that was the kind of first time that it came out. And what, what ended up happening was I discovered not only the power in articulating your dream and giving yourself permission to pursue that dream, but also I discovered a, a new version of myself kind of coming out. Um, this, this version of me that was, you know, I was always like a slacker. I was always like, do the bare minimum, like, you know, minimum viable product. What's the, what's the minimum cutoff? All right, I'm gonna hit that. And, I became somebody who like burst out of bed every day with this like passion and this excitement and of, of like going on Craigslist. You know, I remember I would like <laughs> get up every morning and do my Craigslist rounds. I had like three or four websites that I would check and be like, which student film can I get myself on? And um, it sounds crazy and hilarious um, looking back, but that truly was, I mean, that was like the highlight of my day was like seeing all the parts, I mean, all the parts that were out there for me. I mean, there weren't that many, but um, it, was, it was just, it, it's been such an amazing journey. And, and even if I hadn't, you know, gotten this role of Shang-Chi or Kim's Convenience, I mean, I'd still be 
there, you know? I'd be happy, I'd be working, I'd, I'd probably be in a little bit of credit card debt, like, <laughs> let's be real. But I, I would be in Toronto, I'd be workshopping, I'd be, you know, writing plays for Toronto theaters, I'd be finding some sort of fulfillment in what I did. And that brings me a lot of joy, is, you know, knowing that it wasn't about reaching this destination, it was getting here. The odds, is, or the odds of this is so crazy, crazy low. But, but you know, finding that fulfillment in, in, in the everyday has is, is, is been just the best. So, hope Amazing. that helps. Amazing. So, I, this is actually a question that I really am interested in. Because you write in the book at some point that looking back, particularly in college, you realized you were just a young, anxious, insecure boy who had been told too many times that he wasn't good enough, and all you wanted was to have people like you. So Allie Lee, she asks, how do you handle imposter syndrome? How has it shown up in your career? <laughs> it's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> I was at the Oscars. <laughs> <laughs> imposter sir when I when I tell you it, 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 this is why I feel like nobody here should have imposter syndrome because until you are on a red carpet with Bradley Cooper and friggin Denzel Washington and you're asked to somehow you're they're like now and now you <laughs> um <laughs> You, you, nobody has the right to feel like an imposter, right? You all deserve to be where you are. You all deserve to belong. <laughs> Me, not so much. Not, I, I'm still working on that. Um, I, I recently, this is great, don't clap for this. I recently <laughs> got named one of Time's 100, 100 most influential exactly. people in the world. No, don't Amazing. clap for Amazing. Well deserved. But it's... <laughs> I mean, talk about imposter syndrome. Like, who else is on that list? Zendaya is on that list. <laughs> the CEO of Apple is on that list. Pete Davidson is on. I mean, okay, man. <laughs> you know. I mean, th there's some incredible people on that list. And then there's like me. I made one movie. Um, but I, I have thought long and hard about it. And, um, you know, I, I tried, you know, I. As much as I can, I, I like you know an acting teacher. It's a very, very. His name's Matthew Harrison. He you know taught me once that insecurity and and you know low self-esteem is is very closely related to having high self-esteem. They're they're both the same thing, which is making it about you. It's about holding a mirror to yourself and being fixated on that image. Whether it's positive or it's negative, it's still, the action is the same, right? The when you're feeling insecure, you can't see what's out in the world because there's a mirror in front of you reflecting yourself back. And so every person that you talk to, you can't fully engage with them because you're just so worried about yourself. And um, so I would say the best advice that I got was from, from that same acting teacher was to find a way to get that mirror out of the way so that you can focus on what you're actually looking at and focus on being present. And so for me, you know, I, I know that representation has been such a big part of my life, has been a, you know, I, I want to continue to use my platform and my career to further opportunities for people who look like us, to further our stories and our perspectives. And that is more important than anything to do with me making the list or feeling like an imposter. I just try to get it out of the way. I'm, 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 on a list as a, as, a, as a representative of an idea. And that idea is valuable to me. And so if I am the temporary steward of this idea, if I, if I am just you know, the brief vessel through which this idea and this message is, is delivered, then I accept that. Yeah, amazing. That's incredible. How many of you all agree with me that Simu is absolutely good enough and he should be? on every list, every freaking list. Yes, absolutely. So this is a very high level proprietary question and it may be very tough for you to answer, but okay. Caitlin and Caroline, so this is a duo team, okay. team question, want to know, what is your usual boba tea order? And 
What sweetness percentage uh -huh. do you get? These are very important. <laughs> Controversial. I feel like, is that, the, is that the Asian version of asking pine, about pineapple on pizza? <laughs> it is, isn't it? It's, pe people take their boba orders very seriously. Um, I've worked my way down to like 30%. I could do a 30%. Sometimes I like to treat myself, sometimes a little bit higher. 50, maybe. 70, too sweet, too sweet. Um, I love, um, just, you guys don't have boba guys in Chicago, but are you guys fami anyone familiar with boba guys? Anyone had a boba guys? Yeah, boba guys, delicious. Um, strawberry matcha latte, that's my favorite. If there's no boba guys, I love it. Jasmine milk tea. Jasmine milk tea, 30% sweet. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, once in a while, if I'm, you know, sometimes you don't like the milkiness, I love, uh, I love a lychee green. Lychee green, yeah, yes. Good, Everyone good. take notes. The crowd approves. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> that's good. So I'm gonna give you one last night. I think okay. this is the perfect way to wrap it up. Perfect. What are your biggest wishes for 2022? Oh wow, my biggest wishes for 2022. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've kind of been pretty back to back in my, in my career. I've, I shot Shang-Chi, we debuted the movie. I've shot kind of three other movies back to back to back since then. Four, actually. Wow. And, um, which is awesome. Being booked and busy is great. But, um, Very unslackerish. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, I'm also realizing that there has to be more to life, and you have to, you know, you have to fight for time for yourself. So I'm really excited to to be able to do that. To um, take a little bit of time. I just bought a house. Oh, that's Not the one on Selling Sunset. I just want to be very clear. That one was way too expensive for me. But I did, I am a homeowner now, and I've never, I've, I've spent less than two months in this house in my, in the entire 10 months that I've owned it, so I would really love to, like, be in my actual house and, um, and to just kind of stop, smell the roses, read books that are not my own, <laughs> and, um, and kind of fulfill, you know, fulfill myself, and, and that sounds wrong, I'm sorry. <laughs> to, you get what I mean, to find fulfillment outside of, outside of work. Um, oh boy. <laughs> no way to end. Well, everyone, let's give a big, huge Thank you so much, everybody. For you guys here. have been so great. Thank you. That was Simu Liu with Joanne Molinero live at the Chicago Humanities Spring Festival from 2022. Check out the show notes for links to their books and social media, as well as a transcript for accessibility. We'll be back in two weeks with the flawless Jessica Lang on maintaining an artistic practice and a look back through her career with Chicago theater critic Chris Jones. For more than 30 years, Chicago Humanities has created experiences through culture, creativity, and connection. Check out chicagohumanities.org to sign up for our email list or to become a member for insider exclusives and perks. Plus, you'll help us support all this incredible programming. Chicago Humanities Tapes is produced and hosted by me, Elisa Rosenthal. Be sure to rate, share, and subscribe, available wherever you stream your podcasts and our website. Thanks for listening, and as always, stay human. <laughs>